Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 261 of Stand Up. Joining me today, comedian and lawyer J.L. Covan, constitutional law professor Eric Siegel, and Boston Globe columnist, former speechwriter Michael Cohen. I am Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Hey guys, it is officially the first week and the first show here of 2021. I hope that you had a great taint week, that week between Christmas and New Year's. What did you get done? What did you not get done? Maybe you did nothing. Doing nothing is a really important thing to do, I was told. So I tried to do nothing for a day. I was fairly successful. I watched a couple of things on the on the screens and uh, I lied around. I even took an afternoon nap for no apparent reason. So then the next day I got right back to work and here I am. So oh, uh, uh, wait, I do want to uh, mention New Year's Eve. We had an awesome party virtually on New Year's Eve. It was an epic Zoom party. It got crazy and uh, everybody got drunk and naked and no it did get i mean it was so much fun new year's eve i hosted a virtual party for members of the stand-up community which anybody can be for as little as five bucks for as much as 200 bucks whatever you want to spend to support the podcast and this community that we're building together and it was only 50 people but the the special part was we had all these great uh, drop buys of some of our favorite regular guests here on stand up, including Dr. Aaron Carroll and Dr. Jason Johnson, and today's prof- uh, Eric Siegel and J. Alco Van were there. Christian Finnegan stopped by. John Donvan was there, and it went till two uh, thirty in the morning, and then the after party on Discord. We had such a great time, and so many people talked and laughed and shared that I got a whole bunch of messages the next day on New Year's Day from people saying, oh my gosh, I hope I didn't get too carried away. Was I too obnoxious? And it was hilarious to get those kinds of messages because usually those types of regrets are reserved for traditional, actual, in-person parties where you might actually embarrass yourself some way or another. But I just thought that was great. We had a great, great time, and I look forward to having a lot more good times with this community virtually during the remainder of this pandemic and after when things return to, quote, normal. So sign up now and be a member of the community. We have Hangouts every Thursday at 8 p.m. East on Zoom, and you can always connect with people 24-7 on the Discord platform where you can text, voice, or even video, but you got to be a member, so sign up now at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. I had a whole show planned for you. I had a couple things in the tank that I was ready to share with you, and then on Sunday afternoon, news broke of a leaked phone call between President Trump and his lawyers and the Georgia Secretary of State and his lawyers, where the president basically tried to extort the Secretary of State into just finding some more votes so I can win, for God's sake. So after hearing that, I got a text from a friend, uh, several friends. My phone blew up with uh, with this news, and I, I ran to my metaphorical fire pole and slid down into the shed, started making calls, see who was available to talk about it, give me their take on it, and that's how I got the three guests that I did. And that's what you're paying for if you are paying for it, even though this podcast is free, it's not cheap. It's my network. It's my ability to find the best experts and all the issues that are important to you and your life and your own journey as well as your community and your country and your planet. That's what I talk about every day here on Stand Up and have been for over 12 years between the SiriusXM show and now the podcast. So please consider a subscription. Sign up now. Go to the paid subscription link on the show notes or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. I am in pretty good spirits. I, I, I can't lie. I'm feeling okay here at the beginning of the year. It's hard to feel great ever when you are losing one American every 30 seconds or so to this horrible pandemic and being constantly paranoid and terrified that if I go out to the grocery store to get new food that I'm going to lose my sense of taste and smell forever. It's not easy for any of us and any of our relationships and all doing our best to try to navigate it, figure it out. I got some good time with my family to reconnect over uh, the past couple of weeks, and I'm feeling good about that. And I'm also feeling good to some extent about the near future. Worried about what's going to happen this week in America? 
given the daily tally of coronavirus two weeks post holiday, where more millions more Americans traveled all over the country. Also, given the January 5th runoff, which is going to determine only the future of the health of the planet. And then, of course, January 6th, that's Wednesday of this week, you're going to have no doubt some really serious concerns uh, with street violence in Washington, D.C. Hopefully it's uh, it's not the worst uh, case scenario and and what we have seen. But the president and his supporters have been really rallying the troops for this Wednesday, and it's going to be crazy to see what happens then. So a very consequential week in American politics and American public health. And so I want to get started with uh, the, the news and play some audio clips for you here at the top of the show, as I always do in this first segment. I got a news dump for you and then my three expert guests. But we got to start with just the headlines surrounding COVID, of course, a few things to play for you on that. A few headlines related to COVID. Antidepressant use in England soars as pandemic cuts counseling access. Funeral homes are running out of space as COVID-19 rages. That's the New York Post headline. World War III says L.A. County doctor beset by intensely sick COVID-19 patients. And now to some of the audio around COVID and America, which I just can't lose sight of for the the podcast here. Some days I'll talk about it a lot less, some days a little bit more. I understand how you want to try to avoid it sometimes, but I do want to cover uh, a few clips and a few co- uh, headlines each day on the podcast. Let's start with yesterday, President Trump's Surgeon General Dr. Jerome Adams was on CNN where he was forced to push back on President Trump's claims that COVID cases and deaths are being, quote, far exaggerated. The Trump had been repeatedly claiming coverage of COVID would uh, would fade away. And now he's saying that the CDC is is uh, somehow inflating the death toll and it's being exaggerated. So on CNN's State of the Union, Jake Tapper asked the Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams, about that coronavirus this morning. He tweeted the number of cases and deaths of the China virus is far exaggerated in the United States because of the CDC's ridiculous method of determination compared to other countries, many of whom report purposely very inaccurately and low. When in doubt, call it covid fake news. That is not true. The CDC does not have a guideline of when in doubt, call it COVID. That is not the case. And 350,000 Americans have died from coronavirus. Can you tell the American people, including the families and friends of those who have died from coronavirus, that that is the real death toll? And, And what is it like as the Surgeon General when the president of the United States spreads these lies about the pandemic? Well, Jake, you and I have talked about this, and one of the most challenging things about this entire pandemic from all sides has been trying to get health information to the American people in the midst of the politics. And I don't speak for the president. I speak for the Office of the Surgeon General and the Public Health Service, and I'm focused on making sure people can get the information they need, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, Is the death toll get real? your vaccine when it becomes available. Is the death toll real? 350,000 300, dead Americans. Is that real? Is that an actual number? Or does the CDC have a bogus way of when in doubt, call it COVID as the president falsely claims? From the from a public health perspective, I have no reason to doubt those numbers. And I think people need to be very aware that it's not just about the deaths, as we talked about earlier. It's about the hospitalizations, the capacity. These cases are having an impact in an array of ways. And people need to understand that there's a finish line in sight, but we've got to keep running towards it. All right, that's Dr. Jerome Adams on CNN's State of the Union refuting President Trump's claim of exaggerated statistics. And Dr. Anthony Fauci was on ABC's This Week, where Martha Raddatz asked him a similar question. What did he think about Trump's claims of exaggerated deaths? And sadly, Anthony Fauci had to answer that horrible question. Well, the the deaths are real deaths. I mean, all you need to do is to go out into the trenches Go to the hospitals, see what the health care workers are dealing with. They are under very stressed situations. In many areas of the country, the hospital beds are stretched. People are running out of beds, running out of trained personnel who are exhausted right now. That's real. That's not fake. That's real. Martha Raddatz also asked Dr. Anthony Fauci to take a pause and think about the massive loss of life. 350,000 Americans now, maybe closer to half a million, is the real number. She asked him if you ever thought it would be this bad. No, Martha, I did not. Uh, But, you know, that's what happens when you're in a situation where 
you have surges related to so many factors, inconsistent adhering to the public health measures, the winter months coming in right now with the cold allowing people or essentially forcing people to do most of their things indoors as opposed to outdoors. And then the traveling associated with the holiday season is all of the ingredients that unfortunately make for a situation that is really terrible. I mean, to have 300,000 cases in a given day and between two and 3,000 deaths per day is just terrible. I mean, it is. I mean, there's no running away from the numbers, Martha. It's something that we absolutely got to grasp and get our arms around and turn that, turn that inflection down by very intensive adherence to the public health measures uniformly throughout the country with no exceptions. Dr. Anthony Fauci on ABC yesterday. Here we are in the first week of January, and it continues to be the same story. A horrible, horrible virus terrorizing us each and every day, as well as a horrible man terrorizing us each and every day. And we turn now to the latest in the drama of President Trump in his last 20 days. New Congress was sworn in today. Nancy Pelosi winning re-election to the speakership by just a hair. And I'll talk more with experts about that this week and what we can expect uh, as we find out what happens in the runoff elections on Tuesday in Georgia. But we've got to talk about the big news from yesterday where President Trump, uh, audio was released of President Trump Talking to, in about a one-hour phone call, Georgia election officials, several people on the call with the president. At this point, you probably heard at least excerpts. I listened to the entire thing, and it is really hmm, just the president acting like a, a complete embarrassing fool, just resisting any sense of reason based on data. He refused to believe that he lost the state of Georgia. At this point, you probably heard the excerpts. I've got a bunch of hot takes and then three longer conversations with my guests, Jael Covan, Eric Siegel, and Michael Cohen of the Boston Globe coming up. But first, let's start with CNN's Federica Whitfield and her producers reached out to two of the Watergate players, both reporter Carl Bernstein and former White House counsel to Richard Nixon, John Dean, and CNN's Fred Whitfield asked John Dean what he thought after he'd heard these audio clips. Well, we only, I just heard the four and a half minutes you played, uh, and that's a very small sample. I, my immediate reaction was that the Secretary of State, Raffenberger, uh, he has taken a very safe precaution. George is a one uh, party consent state. You can record your telephone calls. He knew he was being pushed, if not extorted, by the president in this call, so he flipped the switch and uh, he made a record of this call. I think that's very smart. The president is marching right up to the edges of extortion. Uh, there's probably more of this, Fred, uh, given the fact that uh, uh, Trump has been cutting this uh, angle far and wide. So I think there's more tapes probably elsewhere. I think this is a special situation where uh, the Secretary of State wanted to protect himself from a president leaning on him and has done a good job of doing so. And also, former Washington Post journalist Carl Bernstein was on CNN talking about how much worse Donald Trump's phone call with the Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger was than anything that Nixon did and that it was evidence of criminal actions to un do his election loss. Here's Carl Bernstein on CNN with the great Frederica Whitfield on Sunday. This is something far worse than occurred in Watergate. We have both a criminal president of the United States in Donald Trump and a subversive president of the United States at the same time in this one person subverting the very basis of our democracy and willing to act criminally in that subversion. But more important, what we hear on this tape, this is the ultimate smoking gun tape. It is the tape with the evidence of what this president is willing to do uh, to undermine the electoral system and illegally, improperly, and immorally try to instigate a coup in which he remains the president of the United States. And in any other presidency, any other presidency, this tape would be evidence enough to result in the impeachment of the president of the United States, his conviction, 
in the Senate of the United States, and really an immediate call by the members of Congress, including of his own party, that he resign immediately. That's really what we ought to be hearing from Republicans at this moment. Mr. President, resign. Leave the White House. This is unconscionable. It is wrong. And we of your party will not permit it. Now, we're not going to hear that. We might from a few Republicans. But that's what's really called for here. And, and the, the one thing we should recall from Watergate is that the heroes of Watergate were Republicans who would not tolerate Richard Nixon's conduct. Well, Ted Cruz will tolerate Donald Trump's conduct, and so we're going to see a lot more of that this week. Should be exciting and terrifying. All right, Kamala Harris responded to the president's uh, phone call that leaked at the Washington Post, and she was on the campaign trail in Georgia where she was campaigning for John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock. And at this rally, you can hear the, the cars beeping in approval of the vice president-elect Kamala Harris, who excoriates President Trump yesterday. Have y'all heard about that recorded conversation? Well, it was, yes, certainly the voice of desperation. Most certainly that. And it was a bald, bald-faced, bold, abuse of power by the president of the United States. All right. Kamala Harris campaigning with uh, John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock in Georgia yesterday. And I thought this clip was really interesting. This is a Republican congressman who was um, on his way out. Uh, Yesterday was his last day. Outgoing Republican congressman. His name is Denver Riggleman, uh, Virginia. And he was on CNN as well talking about the Senate Republicans' plan to oppose the upcoming certification of President-elect Joe Biden's victory. And this clip is worth the whole two minutes of this Republican lawmaker, Denver Riggleman. I'll have to get him on the show, just ripping his former Republican colleagues. This is not about alien abductions. We're talking about the United States of America, and we're talking about the Constitution. And I think if we keep doing this, if we keep saying, hold my beer, what's the Republican Party going to be at the end of all of this? I, I don't know where it goes from here. What do we do next time? And that's what scares me about this. And I'm sick of false equivalencies. I'm sick of people saying that there's some evidence of this somewhere. My goodness, there's some of the evidence that I've seen has been a few people who voted illegally for Donald Trump. So what are we going to do here? Are we going to start standing up and saying facts matter? Or are we going to go down this sort of this rabbit hole of fantasy based conspiracy theories that was a coordinated grift? That was perpetrated by people in power. And I think that's the thing that we have to worry about right now. I wish I had a cogent answer for you on some kind of philosophical means of them doing this or or what the or the, what the reasoning is. They're, they're, the reasoning is simple. It's free election. It's not building trust in our system. It's re-election. It's fundraising. It's making sure you get those small dollar donors. I had somebody just tell me the other day, and it's a great guy. I respect him a lot. He said, you know, the crazier language we use, the more provocative we are in our mailers or our digital the more money we get. He goes, Denver, we just fundraise. We just fundraise better. Like, so no, let me get this straight. So this is what we're doing this for at this point, because it's just it's just better fundraising. And we're having a tough time. You know, Democrats act blue. You know, we how, how, do, how do we win? And, you know, provocative language is the way to go to fundraise. I think we got to talk to our voters also and say, listen, you can't buy into this. Uh, we, we have to have a facts based solution. And I'm sorry I'm taking some time on this, Anna, but at some point we got to we got to call facts facts. And we got to say that that these Kraken based, you know, conspiracy theories are ludicrous, that there's people out there saying that Vice President Pence is is treasonous. I mean, this is absolutely insane. It's incre- it's insane. And, and I don't know what else to say about it. it looking from the outside now, I'm not going to be a congressman tomorrow after 1159. And you know what? They, they're going to be very afraid because they've released me into the wild. And my life has been fighting disinformation and terrorism. So if this is what they want me going after them outside the system, this is where I do my best work. And I think that's what I'm tired of, Anna, is I'm tired of people not able to tell the truth or doing, thing out of, doing things out of hypocrisy so they can raise money. All right, I'm going to have to get that guy on the show. And now it's time for what I call the news dump. I just played a bunch of audio clips for you now, and I've given you some uh, some takes and some analysis on politics. But now it's time for stories that are not related to COVID, not related to Politics. Quick hits on undercover subjects. It's the news dump. They call them dumps. Big, massive dumps. 
The Coast Guard on Friday, according to the Associated Press, suspended its search for a boat that went missing with 20 people on board. The travelers have taken the white and blue 29-foot Mako Cuddy Cabin vessel to Bimini, a chain of islands in the Bahamas, according to the Sun Sentinel. It departed Bimini. Monday was expected to reach Lake Worth Beach in South Florida the following day. No information about who was on the boat has been made public. In Texas, the pastor of a Methodist church was killed with his own gun by a man sought by the police who'd taken shelter in the building. Three others, including the gunmen, were hurt. Police chased Saturday night in East Texas, culminated in a fatal confrontation on Sunday morning at a church between its pastor and a fugitive who was hiding there. Ooh, terrible story. That's one of the reasons why I don't want to have guns, because I feel like that's how I go. The guy would, the uh, intruder would take my gun and kill me with it, which is a rough way to go out. And don't worry, everybody. Americans aren't the only dumb people who are ignoring the dangers of COVID. In France, please shut down a rave that was held in defiance of their COVID-19 restrictions. So it's not only Michael Seaver, Kurt Cameron, caroling in California, there's a party that had like 2,500 people began New Year's Eve in spite of curfew and abandoned large gatherings. Authorities in France say three officers were injured trying to shut down the event. CNN is reporting that the online sensation that became Ratatouille, the TikTok musical, has raised over $1 million for the Actors Fund, an organization for struggling performers impacted by the pandemic. The musical premiered on the social media platform New Year's Day, featured household names like Wayne Brady, Titus Burgess, and Adam Lambert. The news of its monetary success was announced Saturday on the production's Twitter page at Ratatusical. Wow, million dollars. See, that's a good news story. In business headlines, Bitcoin has soared past $33,000, its highest ever. If you want to know what that means, don't ask me. And Tesla hit half million car target in 2020. I hope to add to that in 2021. Oh, I really want to buy a Tesla. U.S. gas prices end the year at a near pandemic era high. Gas prices are now their highest point since the pandemic prompted stay at home orders in March. The average price of a gallon of gas stood at 225 on Thursday, according to AAA. All right, that is your news dump for Monday, January 4th, 2020. And there's so much I didn't even get to, like the 10 living former defense secretaries who declare election is over in a forceful public letter. And uh, I get to that, I think, with, I think, Eric Siegel. But first up, I've got a conversation with J.L. Covan. Before I get to my conversation, I want to play a funny video that he made. J.L. Covan, a very funny comedian, a Georgetown-educated lawyer who still practices law for a big firm in New York and uh, has made a killing this year doing his Trump impression on Cameo. He's got two podcasts as well. But let's uh, take a listen to J.L. Covan's Donald Trump's version of the call with uh, the Georgia Secretary of State and others. You're not recording this, are you? Okay, good. No, excuse me. I know Georgia is a one party consent state. I've told many women that, okay, many, a lot more women than you've gotten, believe me. But you need to find some votes. You need to find votes, okay? Would you, by the way, I heard that uh, the Atlanta Hawks were voting, okay? They have Hawks. You didn't even, you haven't even, excuse me, you haven't even mentioned the fact that you have, they're called birds of prey, okay? And I don't care if they're Christian birds, they can't vote, okay? So I think there are at least 10,000 Atlanta Hawks voting. And they're, excuse me, their alone is enough to almost give me the win. And Mike, Mike, our great vice president, Mike Pence is here. And he said he was in Atlanta and there's a lot of down low things going. You said that, Mike, right? A lot of down low activities in Atlanta. So I think if you look carefully, you'll find the votes. And if you don't find the votes, you know, I might have to have somebody arrest you. I think what you're doing is criminal. Maybe. I think the best thing for you right now is to stop doing criminal activity and declare Georgia for me, okay? So, Brad, do the right thing, but not like that black movie, okay? Don't do that right thing. Do the right thing by your president, okay? This is, we're stopping the steal, or else, you know, I will uh, throw you in jail and uh, do other horrible things to you. But no, no, excuse me. That's called presidential 
negotiation. It's not extortion, okay? Extortion is when you, you know, have a lot of bugs and you kill them, okay? So we're doing very strongly. Stop the steal. Shut up, Brad. Excuse me. Do the right thing, but not the black way. And we'll see what happens. <laughs> and now on to my conversation with Jay Elko Van. That's him on Twitter, at Jay Elko Van. He's got two podcasts. Both are linked in the show notes as well as everything else you want to know about him. He was with us on our New Year's Eve party, and it was a riot. We really enjoyed him. People always request that he joins me, and I'm trying to get him on every week now if I possibly can because he's so smart. His analysis is just as good as his humor. Here's my conversation with JL Covan kicking us off. What are your reactions to this call? What does it mean, if anything? You mean you calling me? It means that uh, Eric Siegel is now no longer your go-to legal correspondent. He comes on after you tonight. Oh, hey, how are you, Professor? Uh, no, I know what you meant. Um, I I don't know that you needed a league. I think you just wanted the Trump impersonator on. It. It's Eric Siegel will know a lot better than me the nuances uh, of what this means, but it's pretty – this is – I think he should be impeached. I know that's not practical, but I'm looking at this going at what point, And I've said this repeatedly. At what point do you say, well, the terrorist uh, is going to is going to leave the building in 18 days. So why don't we just let him hold everybody hostage? And he pro- he, he he has to leave in in two and a half weeks. So. What what more could he do? What damage could he really do in two and a half weeks as president of the United States while actively working against democracy and America? Well, how is this damaging? How is this phone call damaging uh, to the country? Well, I think what it is, is it's more it's, you know, the 10th smoking gun. Mm. I think it's it's making a mockery of everything. I think anybody who's in a way, you're right. In a way, it's just the most blatant outrage of what he what we already know he is doing. Um, I'm glad it's going to embarrass some of these senators. That's I think that's great that like the Hollies and Cruises of the world are yeah. going to be like, oh, I, I was OK with his coup until he was extorting Republicans, uh, secretaries. Why of do state. you think that they will run from him now? No, no, they can't run. They can't. R- I said, R- I'm glad it will embarrass them, okay. but they, they, they can't run. What you don't go 98% through with a coup and then go, you know what? This is a bridge too far. Right. <laughs> like, right. This is just more, this is just embarrassing evidence of what he's been doing. I forgive me for asking the obvious question, but I I like the way you talk. What did Donald Trump do wrong in this phone call when he called the secretary of state of Georgia? Okay. Well, as far as I only heard uh, the snippets, I haven't listened to the full call, which only came out, I think like an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, once again, it's as Michael Cohen has said, it's the mob boss innuendo, which you have to be willfully stupid not to hear. Mm. Like there's a plausible explanation of like, oh, I never threatened him with criminal prosecution if he didn't reverse the results. I simply said what you and what you have done is a crime. And, you know, I forget how he said it, but it was basically one of his will have to look into it. The implication is very clear of like, do right by me or else. I'm president and I'm accusing you of a crime, which he has no evidence of. A crime has not been committed by the secretary of state. So it's you. You the only way to not see Donald Trump as trying to bully or extort or clearly abuse, abuse his power. I mean, that's very clear. That's that doesn't take a legal scholar or student. That just takes somebody embracing common sense to say, yeah, of course, this guy's trying to intimidate flex his presidential power to get the secretary of state of a state to basically disenfranchise voters. What do you make of people comparing uh, his tactics to uh, some type of a mob boss? Well, that's it is because it's 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 as if he speaks like a guy who expects to be wiretapped. You know what I mean? Like, so the phone call coming out, notice he didn't say, I'll, you know, what Trump probably wanted to say was, I will, I will bury you, you piece of fucking shit. Right. If you don't do something about this, 
Now, that would be, oh, my God, he said that. This gives that little wiggle room for an attorney or a sycophant to go, you know, I'm waiting for Kaylee McEnany to say, you know, no, what the, pre- the president just loves his country so much that he speaks forcefully in defense of her. You know what I mean? Like that, like he if you thought somebody was stealing democracy and the country from you, wouldn't you speak in the most angry and harsh of terms? That's you know what I mean? So like they they they. It's just, like I said, it's just embarrassing. And it's the latest, greatest example of his um, just disgraceful conduct. And I I cannot help but think how people could genuinely say, oh, Hillary Clinton. I know I always come back to Hillary Clinton, but I'm sorry. We had the opportunity to Mm. avoid Mm. all of this. Mm. You may not like her or she may not be your cup of tea, but this is the difference between um, we could have picked the um, we could have picked the rude cashier at Wendy's as our president or the guy who raped Wendy. <laughs> and we said, I, I well, they're both the same. For they're, both the, they're both the same. So let's just at least the other always, guy isn't always, a career politician. I always love going back and, and, and uh, especially when, when it's reframed in such a brutal way. Uh, the, the big, the big problem, if you selected one sentence in this tape that people uh, seemingly are pointing to is, I just want to find 11,780 votes. What do you, what do you make of, of that part of the call? I just want to find. Yeah. Well, what I will That's say one of his is, things, he says things like that to anybody yeah, that he wants a, to find a friend, a friend, a mutual friend, uh, Chris Lambert, because I know I, I listened to you on his uh, podcast recently. Yeah. Um, he tweeted when the tape came out today, he said, it sounds like one of JL's off the podcast record comments from his Trump podcast. Right. Repeatedly, I go off the record on um, you know, every episode. I'll usually have a comment where I speak very honestly about the election or my followers. And it's just it's the brutal honesty that you really think he feels for whatever the issue is. You know, like, oh, my supporters are all dumb, Bible thumping morons. I hate them. Uh, th- things like that will be off the podcast record. And the 11,000, like the specificity of the number, which is so moronic um, because it's so telling on yourself. He didn't say he could have just said there's 20,000 votes, but he like literally was like, I just need one more than what I lost by. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I did that on the podcast at least twice since he lost wow. where I just said, And uh, how many votes did Biden win by? What is it up to now? 7.1 million. Well, as you know, there were 7.2 million fraudulent (laughs) votes. Like I do that all the time because it's so dumb that it's funny, except that's literally what he's doing for like the 14th time in his presidency. He's he's following my podcast lead. (laughs) That is one of the things that makes your impression of him so interesting because it's you're you're psychoanalyzing him while you're doing it, saying things that he either is thinking or can't say, certainly wants to say, which is one of the reasons I love it. But, you know, how how significant is this is this phone call, do you think, to Tuesday's runoff election? Um, Great question. Uh, The runoff election to me, this is I consider Ossoff and Warnock to be Hillary Trump three. In other words, we had Hillary Trump and the country chose Trump. Biden Trump was the sequel and we chose Biden. And to me, this is a this to me, even though Georgia is a purple shading red state, this is such a test of is it only party Is it party above everything else, above democracy, decency, honesty? And I don't mean that in a political slogan kind of way. I mean, right in your face are two crooks who have enabled and defended this man who is literally trying to disenfranchise voters. That really shouldn't be partisan. Like you should look at that and say the same way I'll bring up. How about this, Eric Siegel? Fruit of the poisonous tree, the, <laughs> the doctrine of when, when police do certain misconduct, the evidence has to be thrown out. That's not because the evidence isn't valid. It's a built in rule through our Supreme Court jurisprudence that basically says when you abuse the system, there's got to be a penalty. 
You might beat a confession out of a guy and it's true. You might lie to get a warrant because you know the gun or the evidence is there. Like you may even be doing it with an, a noble end. You're, 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 you're using unconstitutional means to justify what may actually be, hey, I know this guy murdered this girl. And I got to beat the confession out of him or I got to I got to forge a document so I can get it. You may actually know he's the killer or the, the assault. But the system says because we're trusting you with sort of honor code type type conduct, we have to penalize you with taking away this evidence if mm. you violate the constitutional safeguards, because otherwise we can just have a bunch of people running around lying. And when I look at this, I look at what's going on and I say, if this country and if every state, and we know it wouldn't be every state, obviously, but every state in this country should say, there's got to be a price to pay for enabling someone who wants to dis- just because he's bending, breaking, smashing norms, yeah. even if you don't think he's committed a crime, we have to, as a populace, as a citizenry, punish that and and those accomplices who would do that even if if i were republican in georgia i would like to think i would be somebody who'd say any other year i'm supporting uh conservative judges and uh fiscal conservatism low taxes etc but this year's different this year it's important that i as somebody who does love America, enjoys its freedoms and the rights I have and what it stands for. This has to be a message. And it's a message with substance. It's not a third party vote in 2016 saying, I just don't like the either side. So I'm no, this is a a, a message with value. It says America, when pushed to the edge, has citizens in all 50 states, which we know is not true, who will vote and give a majority to two decent men who care about the country and care about people, even if those policies are not my cup of tea. Because what what, what Purdue and and and, and Leffler stand for, they shouldn't. This shouldn't even be a contest anyway. They're crooks. <laughs> yeah. But this should this should swing. This should be the James Comey in reverse. This should be enough. That anybody who's undecided, if there's the phone 30 call people, I'm sorry, the phone call should be enough. Yes, it's because this is who they've been defending and they have known this is who they're defending. This call doesn't represent anything else except more blatant evidence of what he's been doing. Yeah. And it's sad to think that, you know, what Stacey Abrams has done in Georgia is, is miraculous. And I hope she's the governor in two years. But you look at it and you say. I wish it wasn't just. We've got to get a super a super turnout from black voters. It should be anybody with a conscience, anybody of faith, anybody who believes in something bigger than just cyclical politics should yeah. say it has to stop here. It has to stop with us now. I will vote against Stacey Abrams in 2022. I will vote for but it won't. Uh, Mitt it won't. Romney You're in 2024. But, ideally, this but, the, the people would be principled enough to draw the line here. But let's just. I mean, you don't think anyone will will really change their mind or change their vote, do you? I'm I'm no, no. Change their vote. No, I'm just hoping that those ridiculous swing voters that seem to exist all the time when you feel like there is no swing left. If you if you are about to vote, if you have not voted and you don't know who you're voting for, I don't think it's changing. But if you are in the possible 10,000 people who could swing both of these Senate races. Yeah. How do you not switch? Like if you truly are undecided, how in the you fuck? only care about one thing or another? No, no. But then, but then, but then that's what I'm saying. Then you are already decided. Right. Right. Well, like, okay. Like, yeah. No, good point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you, and I'm saying it's a small number, but as we saw, Biden won the state by 12,000. Right. Maybe it's 8,000 people who will decide one of these Senate races. And I don't know how you look at this and go, I'm a patriot, but I like the guy who wants to fuck like, yeah, I don't I don't like the guy who votes for Trump. But if 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 Bill Murphy in New Jersey were, were working with Joe Biden to purge the votes of South Jersey, I'd be like, what the fuck are we doing? Right. 
Let, like <laughs> that's that's no all really really good points. Uh, let me ask you this final qu- the question though. That t- to me, what is so uh, upsetting and insane and 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 terrible about every moment of every hour of every day since the election is that the president of the United States and so many others in Congress, Republicans and his supporters, are are not doing more, not spending more time on trying to get the vaccinations out and all things COVID. And so, given this phone call. Given the past month, over a month since the election, how, how do you articulate the kind of the, the, the single minded focus that this president and so many of his supporters have had on a conspiracy to overturn the election instead of over 3000 Americans dying every single yeah. day? Well, they are a coalition of, of the, the cruel, the stupid um, and the selfish. And what I what I. Donald Trump, if he wanted to run in 2024, I've said this before, probably on this podcast and definitely on others, Donald Trump could have won re-election or he could have set himself up to win in 2024 if he had any foresight and any patience. He could have, he could have, I'm just taking it back to when the COVID, when COVID hit, he was concerned about the stock market. He just did. He wanted to lie. He wanted to hide everything so that the stock market, like he didn't want anything to happen to his precious stock market because that was his crown jewel. Now, if he had said to himself, hey, wait a second, if I know I'm not up for reelection for another nine months, if I go at this shit hardcore, if I'm if I am just balls to the wall, Mr. Guy in command and I turn this around by September nobody's beating me a strong economy, a strong wartime response. It's a wrap, but he has no foresight. He has no patience. He has no, he he cannot look beyond 48 hours and his immediate uh, need for self gratification. Mm. So he kept fucking up. He kept saying, <laughs> well, I'm going to, he kept lying. Then he would lie about masks. And he kept doing that instead of taking a strong nine month year long approach to it. He kept trying to just buy himself. He kept, it was like a Ponzi scheme in reverse. He was like, I'm going to keep burying myself in debt, hoping they don't see how fucked we are. And they'll just stay focused on this. And I think if he had reacted in this lame duck period, even if he really was like, I am going to announce on fucking January 21st that I am coming back. I dominate this party. We are going to take this country back. If he had just taken a strong hands-on approach and said, the next three months are going to determine what I do four years from now. He might have come away with a real political win. He could never have done any he can't, of he has, but he can't he's do not it equipped. He's not equipped to lead anything he's, ever. He's not equipped to look beyond his immediate feelings for himself yeah. and 48 hours. Right. So like he has he does. Right. <laughs> you, said, you said it. He does not have the emotional or intellectual capability to look forward at all. So I think he's going to make the next year. People can talk about, I think he's going away. I think he's going to be ignored. Fuck that. He, and I'm not saying this for my own comedy. He is, he can't go anywhere. Well, I think there's two, there, I actually think he can go somewhere because he could be deplatformed on social media. He could be de, he could be uninvited on television. He could have a hard time getting his actual words and message to be heard. It's probably unlikely, but it's possible also more, most importantly, he does not have power. He doesn't have the power of the government behind him. And he's not casting threats and fears to people who would otherwise be rank and file bureaucrats to, you know, get the vaccine to where it needs to be, et cetera, and do the right thing uh, for but fear. Do you, think, do you think Fox News and I know we're going to pretend like Fox News is like a, 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 a more honorable player mm-hmm. in this business than OAN or Newsmax? But do you think at the end of the day, if they determine that Trump rallies and Trump appearances are still good ratings to the to the 70 million diehards, they're not abandoning that. They they may not. They may. The, the TV ratings may not. But I do think that if he's uh, deplatformed on Twitter, that would be that would massive. Be ama- massive. I mean, that would be um, that would be worthy of like parties, like an actual party. for real for real. Let, can we plan one now? Yeah, you well, and I, I will co-host. I, we'll we'll do all oh, of yeah. our platforms together to do a de-platforming on Twitter Trump party. 
Yeah, okay. and I've, I've said the day Trump dies, I'm dubbing it Trump Teenth, and it's becoming a new national holiday. All right, I will join you all in that act <laughs> in, in that celebration as well. Thank I you. I want to build a statue of Trump just so I can knock it down, like when he passes away. <laughs> well, like, then, like because I don't know. He, talk about planning for only forty eight hours. I mean, you're having to look at that thing every day. I mean, it's a, it's a real long game potentially. I just I think of other leaders where I always go, there's no he is there needs to be a statue to topple. You're not wrong. Yes. And I think I think there will be. And I know I know you got to get out of here or we got to get out of here. But I I do look forward to like my predictions. I may put forward like a blog with like my Trump predictions for the next 10 years. That's good. There will be several failing elementary schools in the South that will be dubbed Donald J. Trump like (laughs) elementary. and, And they'll have like the worst the worst academic records and like, you know, middle school pregnancy. What will they serve in the cafeteria for the school food? Like Soylent Green, Trump branded something. Just Oh, sure. Sure. No, it's, 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 I can't wait for, I can't wait when they try to pull their own Jim Crow, like in the South, you know, it's going to be the same thing. Just like during, after reconstruction, all those, you know, and during before world war one, I, I think is when all those statues went up. It wasn't like in the aftermath of the civil war. Cause it was to demean newly that's enfranchised right. black that's right. people. That's right. And that's what it's going to be about. It's going to be like, we're putting up a statue. We're naming buildings that there's going to be a frenzy among the dumbest idiot neighborhoods and cities in this country. Once he's gone. Your predictions, I hope you're wrong. Thank you, as always, for joining me. Awesome analysis, as always. All right, there goes J. Alco Van. Follow him on Twitter. Hire him on Cameo. Buy his album. Subscribe to both of his podcasts. Just go to the show links for this episode, and you can link to all of that information. All right, next, as promised, I reached out to Professor Eric Siegel, who is a constitutional law professor and expert at Georgia State University, the author of two books, Supreme Myths and Originalism as Faith. Subscribe to his podcast, which is called Supreme Myths. Here's my conversation with him. Follow him on Twitter at eSpinSiegel. Here we go. Take number two. All right. Now I have the legal legal Eric Siegel to get uh, an even smarter response than J.O. Colvan uh, just gave on Trump's phone call and, and what it all means, because we wanted to get more expertise. How big of a deal is this? Thank you for joining me. Well, first of all, Happy New Year to one and all. Yep. Um, I think it's a very I, I think it is an extremely big deal uh, in, in this sense that he committed a crime, maybe. He's not, he's not going to be prosecuted for it. But but there are federal and state laws against election interference like this. Uh, you'd have to prove a lot of intent. And as a technical matter, what a jury, who knows? Who cares? Pete, this is the first time in four years that I think he's finally done it. Like, I don't think he I I'd be surprised he can recover from this in the sense that when he, once he leaves the presidency, you know, he'll have his TV network, whatever. I think his public life is over. I think if he ever ran for president again, this tape would run over and over and over and over again. Mm. And to that, and I've listened to most of it. I couldn't get every second, but I've listened to most of it. Um, and I also don't know, I don't know what Cruz and Hawley, the two, two of the senators who are both, um, constitutional lawyers or think they are, um, what they're planning to do on, on, on Wednesday in terms of challenging the vote. Mm. I mean, why wouldn't Democrats in the Senate just play this recording and say, this is the guy you're supporting right here? Um, the president of the United States is not allowed to, under any norm of office, call and berate a secretary of state to get him to change election results. This is even for, well, I'm sure Trump has done a thousand things like this, right. but never on tape. Um I think that Republicans are going to have a, of course, the crazy Republicans will still, you know, be around. I don't think Cruz and Harley can survive this and support Trump. We'll see. But this is the first time I thought that in four, there's never been a moment in four years where I thought maybe his base will think. Why do you think that? Why do you think this is different? Because we heard it. Yes, of course. That makes all the difference. But don't you um, think that uh, his supporters and um, in Congress and in the media will uh, find plenty of ways to say that he did nothing wrong? And this is a perfect, yeah, I don't, a I don't, perfect phone I, I don't call. Think so. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. <laughs> why. I don't think it can be spun. Maybe it can. I'm not a media expert, Pete. But here's the thing. The head of the Georgia Republican Party, and I may, I may get in trouble for this because I just 
called him a traitor. Um, but the head of the Georgia Republican Party claims that this tape recording should never have been released because it was part of a settlement agreement in litigation and the parties agreed it would be secret. In other words, his defense, this is the head of the Republican Party in Georgia, his, but he's a Trump guy. His defense is not there was nothing wrong. He didn't say there's nothing wrong. That wasn't his first line of attack. And he didn't say and he didn't say it was fake. He could, you know, they could have said it was fake. They didn't say that. They said it shouldn't have been released. Well, if that's their best argument, it's over. My understanding I mean, is in Georgia, where you live, you're allowed to uh, tape one side of a conversation. It's legal. Well, that wasn't what he was saying. And, uh, right. He, he wasn't saying that. He was saying it was part of set. There is a federal. What he said was wrong. In what he said made no sense. But this is what he's saying. There's a federal rule of civil procedure, I think, or federal rule of evidence, but something like that, that says settlement negotiations are secret, which they should be, of course. If two parties are going to ne- meet to, to settle a lawsuit um, and you want them to have full candor so they can settle it, what one party says during those negotiations can't be used against that party in a, in, in a lawsuit, which makes total sense if you think about it, right? You and I have a, a car accident. We decide to try to settle. During our settlement negotiations, I say something like, well, yeah, I was driving a little fast, but so were you. Let's try to settle this. My statement, I was driving a little fast, is inadmissible in court, and it should be. Because All we right, but this was, how was yeah. this a settlement nothing, negotiation? Nothing. He, what, he, he could have... It was just I'm a gonna, phone call, wasn't it? There was no lawsuit. Well, there was, it, it, well, no, he claims there were two lawsuits pending, but it doesn't matter, Pete. It only applies in court. <laughs> it doesn't oh. apply anywhere else. It doesn't matter. It does Right. Your first point is accurate. I don't think this was in the context of a settlement litigation. But even if it was, it wouldn't matter. The only the only penalty is, is not even the right word. All right. So if Trump is sued by the secretary of state of Georgia, maybe these statements couldn't be used in that lawsuit. It has nothing to do with him, the presidency, what's happening in this week. It's irrelevant. It's as if he had said, I'm going to be very, very intellectual. Now. If the Georgia, if the head of the Georgia Republican Party had tweeted, Blick, blick, black, black, blick, blick, blick. It would have made just as much sense as what he tweeted. <laughs> so, um, but, that, but that's interesting, though, Pete, because that's, that was the first line of defense, that it shouldn't have been released, not some other spin. All right, fine. We can argue about whether or not it should have been released. Nonetheless, right. is that a word? Right. Trump pressured a secretary yes. of state of Georgia to find the vote, Seth Abramson is a political science uh, professor yeah, but he, and author. He, he is. He's a little bit. He's a Go little ahead, bit. You can you can yeah, say whatever yeah. you want, but yeah. I think yeah. this tweet, uh, amongst many that he's been tweeting, the guy never stops tweeting. Uh, he tweeted everything Trump raises was litigated in state and federal court. He's taking cases he lost in their proper fora and trying to resurrect them with a man he feels he has power over and aims to threaten. That he tried the cases in court means legally he knows it's where they belong. I think that was pretty smart. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's right. I think the more interesting, I think the, I think the, like, I think two things are true today that w- that were not true five hours. Mm-hmm. So this came out at one o'clock, I think, or noon, whatever. So we're taping this at six thirty. Yeah, it was like two fifteen or something. Go ahead though. Yeah. Okay. So there's something true. There's a, there's a couple things that I think are true tonight that I don't think were true this morning when we woke up. Oh. What are they? One, I think this makes the Senate's objection to the um, uh, to the certification of the votes, which is all show anyway. It's not going to, you know, but it right. makes that much harder. Like, I don't think they ha, it's going to be hard for them to do with straight face. They may, but I think it's going to be harder hmm. Two, more importantly, Pete. I just have to think <laughs> otherwise I won't be able to sleep tonight. Do you want me to sleep tonight? I do. OK. Some small percentage of Trump's base was lost today. I just have to think that. I'm sorry. Well, I just have to. Why do you think <laughs> that? Because I'm I'm surprised because you have been tweeting or retweeting others who, and I agree with this, they are a cult. And so what you're saying is that the fever of the cult follower was somehow broken by this recorded phone call? I'm saying that of the pick a number, what, 20 percent, 25 percent of Americans who make up Trump's space is not that high, probably. But whatever it is, can we call it 20 percent just to be just to be sure. OK. All right. Um, I think there are I'll give you an example, actually. I'm, I don't know if I should do this on air or not. I, I have family members who are evangelicals mm-hmm. and who voted for Trump and they voted for Trump because of abortion. Um, and I, I don't know if they voted for him twice, but I, I'm guessing they did. Mm-hmm. But I know these people. And 
I think he would lose them on this on on this phone call. Like I, I do, I, I could be wrong. I, Pete, I'm not Pollyanna, right? I mean, I've been, I have been the most anti-Trump person in America since six months before he won the nomination. I was on your show ranting and raving and saying he's a one-out person. We know this from New York, but anyway, I think there's a part of his base that will look at this and go, "Enough is enough." Maybe I'm wrong, hmm. but 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 even if it's five percent, that's a lot of people. Three percent, two percent. It's a lot of people. Um, and how do you think I, this affects I, the election, the runoff election in your state of Georgia? Right. That's a great question. I wish, you know, you and I have known each other now for a very, very long time. And one of the first questions you ever asked me was about a case that came out that day that was 85 pages long. <laughs> and I said, Pete, I can give you a very, very, very brief first impression, but I cannot give you a detailed con law professor take on this because it's 85 pages. Well, this is a it. political analysis, really, right. though. Right. So what I'm about to say is I'm not a political guy. Right. So I, I so as a citizen of the state of Georgia, as opposed to an expert on what you're talking about, um, I would like to think that there are Republicans in my state who will look at this and go, we have to start over. We just have to start over this. We, this is this is too much. This is this, so well, find them and let me record a conversation. With them. <laughs> I mean, Pete, don't I'd you love think this to is a bridge to too far. Don't I don't think, think so. A... No, no, I don't. Okay. I don't think so. That I'm being I... the optimistic. So no. wait a minute. For Tina Winston, if you're out there. Yep. I'm not being Mr. Doomsday guy. Pete is being Mr. Doomsday guy. No, well, Go ahead. I just I, I don't know if it's doomsday or not. I just I just don't think I think that the mentality of the Trump supporter has mm-hmm. been to cheat to win. That's the kind of person that supports him. It does mm-hmm. not matter what the rules are. You cheat, you throw the dirt in your opponent's eyes, and then you knock them out. I mean, you cheat. It's all about cheating. It's cutting them off. It's it's cheating on a deal. It's whatever it takes to win, and they don't care about principle or rules or or tradition or norms. They just want to win, at all costs, it doesn't matter what the law is. That's that's I wish I saw it differently, I, I think, but I think that's a fair description of Trump, certainly. And many, many of his supporters are, and many of his supporters. I, I have to say, Pete, that when it comes to politics, you know, the, the, I, I have been fighting false equivalences for four years and, mm-hmm. and not and, and not even I mean, I'm not sideways to you or not directly related to you and you and me. As I've mentioned to you before, we have this very nerdy con law list, but it's really, you know, many of the most important con law professors in the country are on it. People like Steve Vladek, who you know, who really is a great election law guy, Rick Hayes, a lot of people. Anyway, um, on that list, I've been fighting false equivalencies for years. Like they claimed that Obama exceeded all executive authority. He did all these, you know, regulations that weren't justified by Congress. And there is some truth to the fact that Obama did some things that, he, that I disagreed with, certainly executing the American citizen in Yemen. I didn't agree with that. Um, some of his regulations, I think, went too far. But, but okay, that's fine. He made some mistakes. Don't compare him to Trump. Stop it. Just stop it. Like, don't do it. But they still do it. I like, don't know. It's not the same. Hmm. Um, the Trump supporters you just described, there are Democrat supporters like that, too. There's just, you know, anything to win. It's all, all's fair in politics, mm-hmm. love and war, whatever. I want to believe that when you have evidence like this, where the tape doesn't lie, I mean, if they, it, it, there will be some curious Trump based people who will listen to the tape. Not many, but some. And I'd like to think he's a little weaker today than he was at nine o'clock this morning. Mm. In fact, I'm sure he is. I am sure he is weaker today than he was at nine o'clock. Not to mention, by the way, the 10 former, this is important, Pete. That the 10 former defense secretaries who issued this strong statement today, you know, saying this is all this is all wrong and and the military, you know, is not going to be involved in this and all that stuff. That's not secretary of states. That's secretary of defense. All 10 living former defense secretaries yeah. involving the military, they say involving the military in election disputes would cross into dangerous territory. Yeah. But I mean, again, we have seen this type of op ed and petition You're written right. by right. all of the, uh, right. you know, hundreds of, uh, of lawyers, Republican lawyers, national security analysts, every single newspaper in 2016, major newspaper did not endorse Donald Trump. None endorsed him, said better. And um, I'm just not sure that this kind of thing matters. I think this is exactly what the Trump supporter says and says 
uh, you know, this is the establishment and we want to overthrow right. the administrative well, well, state. But there, the are, establishment. But there are Trump supporters who are in the military. I, I, I don't. OK, so what, what, what I mean, you and I agreed 99 percent of the time. I, mm. I'm not saying this is a revolution and I'm not saying I am saying I think this is important. And I haven't really said that before on Trump stuff. Uh, you, you know, I, so so cliches and generalizations are, are, are have to be handled carefully because there's always, you know, but there's usually a kernel of truth in most of them. The cliche roll the tape is important for a reason. He can't deny this happened. I mean, he can. He might. But but effectively, can he really right. deny this happened? Like no, I think I think that always matters when there is tape of a crime. I think grab him by the yeah. pussy tape. And um, yeah. didn't we hear yeah. excerpts of the Ukraine call? Yeah, but those are excerpts, and he claimed they're out of context. Mm. He can't claim that here. There's an hour. Right. There's an hour of Trump. Right, right. I, it's different. And I was just listening to a bunch of it, and he just he's just rambling nonsense. Mm. I mean, it's it's interesting to I listen to. Him, but I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's crazy. It is really crazy. Um, Wednesday is a big day. I it'll be an issue to see when's what well the well, runoff the runoff election in your state Tuesday, Georgia is yeah, Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday and yeah we already voted and on Wednesday is the sixth in which case there what what ha, what is uh, the constitutional procedure that happens on the sixth? Well, the amazing thing, people, by the way, you're coming in and out, so I don't know. I hope this sounds okay because you are coming in and out of my phone. Um, you sound perfect. What's interesting? What's interesting about Wednesday? Is you ask me what the constitutional requirements are and all that. Um, there really aren't many constitutional requirements. There, there is a constitutional requirement that on January 20th, um, if there's a vacancy in the office, Pelosi is the president. Like if there's a, if the election is still somehow disputed on 120, Trump has to go on paper, on paper in the constitution. He has to go. He cannot be president past January 20th. Um, all this talk today about moving that date, not going to happen, can't happen. At least on again, all I'm talking about now is on paper. You know, mm-hmm. if Trump has tanks, then it's kind of um, the Constitution <laughs> is terribly silent about how this whole thing works. But there is a statute, a federal statute that tells us how this works. And basically, and this is a terrible statute, but it was written in 1876 when there was no when the election was disputed and a president was selected. Pete, someday we should do a whole seg- a whole thing on this. Most Americans don't know this. I don't mean that in a snobby way. In 1876, the election was totally disputed. It was all a mess. Um, basically, there was a 15-person commission, including Supreme Court justices, to decide who was going to be the winner. Um, that all got fouled up. But eventually, they it was a backroom deal, Pete. They went hmm. to the back of the room and made a deal. And what happened was they agreed to let the re- Republican, who was the, the Republican Party, was the Liberal Party, the anti-slavery party. The Republican pre- guy got the, got the presidency. In exchange for taking the northern troops out of the south and reconstruction ended that day. And that and that's a disaster. That, that That's one of the most disastrous events in American history. However, after that disaster, they passed this law, the, the, the 1876 law that is binding on Wednesday, which basically says if one member of the Senate and one member of the House object to the count, then both houses uh, go their separate ways. And get this for two hours. That's it. <laughs> Just two hours. And then they vote. If both houses, this is important for the future, Pete. If both houses voted to not use the, the certifications from the states, if the Republican Party controlled the House of Representatives yep. right now, yep. Trump would probably be the next president. Yep. I mean, it's crazy. We got to change that law. But anyway, because the House would never do that. I don't even think the Senate would do that this year. Um, they'll go and scream at each other for two hours. They'll come back. They'll certify Biden. He'll be president. And then the industry, and then it gets really interesting. What does Trump do between January 6th and right. January 20th? Right. Now, a normal sociopath, there is such a thing, a normal narcissist sociopath would, I think, get all kind of into himself. I mean, internally, sulk a lot, scream a lot, but go away. I don't know what Trump's going to do. I mean, I, yeah. do you know what Trump's going to do? No, I think the main concern is that some mid-level uh, officer in the military will be convinced uh, or right. blackmailed even right. to do something uh, to uh, you know make an order that is unlawful. I don't think it's going to be from top brass, and 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 that could do you know any un, un, unspoken amount of of damage. I, I hope that's not going to be the case. 
Uh, but those, you're right, from January 6th to January 20th is uh, very important for, uh, two weeks and 14 days. Can you even believe we're having this? No, back I can't it, because yeah. there's three over 3,000 Americans are dying every day. And so the, the fact that we're talking about this and the fact that all leaders are not focused uh, like a laser on just that one thing and, and distributing the vaccines, which is something that they could all be working together to do. Instead, they're focused on trying to steal the election. A mad man. That's called what it yeah. is, Pete. He's yeah. a madman. We have a madman as president. Yeah. He was a madman in 2016. He was a madman in 1989. And, uh, um, yep. I mean, I, yep. for, this, for people listening who don't know this, I think it's really important to understand that Trump has never changed. So there, just real quick, just for, in case they don't know the story, you know, these five black kids in the 80s are accused of raping this jogger in Central Park. And it was a huge deal. Front page headlines, everything. And DNA, and Trump was, of course, all over it, saying we need more police. You know, he, was, he was doing this all his Gestapo stuff. And then DNA evidence cleared all five, and they were released. And I think, I believe New York City paid them a whole lot of money. Um, I'm not positive about that, Pete, but I think they did. Anyway, after the DNA comes out, Trump still says they're guilty and says it to this day. Now, we're done. Like at that moment, I mean, there's so many yeah. other things. But well, I'm glad that you I'm glad that you brought that up because it's it's who he's always been. But it's also yes. really important to mention um, he re- he refuses to ever lose anything. So if he's yeah. playing golf or 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 making a bet <laughs> or running an election, he refuses to lose. And I was reminded by some old tweets when Ted Cruz, I think, beat him in the Iowa primary. Yes, he Trump, claimed he was cheating. Yes, yeah, he yes. said he cheated, and, and it was <laughs> he never can lose anything ever. And when he is clearly lost, he makes a literal now federal case about why he has not lost and why his competitor has cheated him on from the smallest golf match to the presidential election. Always been that way. You're right to say he never changes. Yes. So now can I rant for two minutes at the end about my stuff? Yes, this is my go ahead. Stuff. This is this is part so of this uh, is my stuff. So, yeah. so it's 2016. Mm-hmm. Trump somehow wins the Republican primary, which was crazy as it was. Um, and now he's running against a woman who <laughs> was secretary of state, senator from New York, first lady. Mm-hmm. But long before that, a graduate of Yale Law School who, who didn't go work for a big law firm. I mean, she may have like a year, but she was basically a public interest lawyer, you know, devoted her life to the public. I don't like Hillary Clinton that much. I think she's fine. I I don't like her husband, but she was a totally legitimate candidate for president. And this is what happened. Leonard Leo, who at the time was the executive vice president of the Federalist Society, along with other people, including to my great chagrin, a ex very close friend of mine um, who was at Heritage named John Malcolm, who Adam Liptak of the New York Times Supreme Court reporter reported John Malcolm made the list, the Supreme Court list that Trump waved around during the campaign. It was, turned out it wasn't John. He was the face. It was like the Federal Society and Leo. It doesn't matter. These elite lawyers at the Federal Society, at Heritage, they – Trump wouldn't know Scalia from Shakespeare. So when he came out <laughs> saying, I want judges, I want judges like Scalia, I want – he used the word originalist, right? Like he knows what that is. Um, they and they and they absolutely supported him and they helped him a lot. Now, here's the thing. He won by eighty eight thousand votes in three states. He does not win without that Supreme Court list. I don't care what anybody says. I know it's a counterfactual, but I'm right. Yeah, he does not win without that list. He does it's, not get the evangelicals as, as in the numbers he gets without that list. You here's and, what I'm mad about. Go ahead. Here's what I'm mad about. The Federalist Society should fucking own that. Now, how they, how would they own that? They would say, at the time, our executive vice president made a mistake in judgment. That's all. That's all. Why is that so hard? They picked a narcissist sociopath who we knew from 1989 was that because they wanted their judges. But it was never worth it. At the time, we, we meaning law professors who were in this conversation, told them, we understand you want your judges. You have a right to your judges. If Ted Cruz were the nominee, you'd have a right – This man is not Ted Cruz. He's a one out, terrible, awful, can't be president, bet your country guy. And they didn't listen. And they've never apologized. And I want them to apologize. That's what I want. You'll never get that apology. But I I do always appreciate that 
uh, rant or one similar. And it's also so, interesting because yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I spoke with Jay Alcovan earlier and he made a similar kind of going back to two th- 2016 and talking about Hillary Clinton. It's interesting that you both did that because the bottom line is so much of this could have been uh, avoided, but it's yeah. all in the past. And this yeah, is the simulation but, but it is in the that we're living one, in. With, with one caveat, Pete, with one <laughs> caveat. I, I, I mean, they got their judges, but if this comes around again, I, I think I think they have to be reminded. Like, I, I think. Sure. I know that we're, you know, I mean, and, and, and we can roll the, we can roll. And a you'll be there to remind them. And I will uh, be sure to give you that platform every time that you want Thank it. But people should be listening Thank to your pleasure. podcast as well. Supreme Myths. It's fantastic. Yep. And uh, it's going great. And I'm so happy that you're able to join me in short notice. As always, I well, really I appreciate it. I never, ever have been able to do that podcast without your assistance over the years. Keep up the good work, buddy. I love you and adore you and everything <laughs> attached to you. <laughs> All right, my friend. All right. All right. That is Professor Eric Siegel, Georgia State University. Get his books. Subscribe to his podcast. Follow him on Twitter at EastspinSiegel. All the information for him, of course, in the show notes for today as well. And finally, I wanted to reach out to Boston Globe columnist Michael Cohen, who I always love talking to about politics and about this major breaking story on Sunday afternoon. Michael Cohen is... Like I said, a columnist at the Boston Globe. You can subscribe to his weekly newsletter, Truth and Consequences. Follow him on Twitter at SpeechBoy71, the author of several really important books. I reached out to him on Sunday night to get his take and interpretation. Take number three on the leaked phone call between President Trump, his lawyers, and the Secretary of State of Georgia and his lawyers. This just escalated in a way that I feel like we didn't even see coming, which is kind of the M.O. of this president. What do you think? That changes. I mean, I don't think it, it's a, you know, it doesn't think it changes much. But I don't think it's a big surprise. You know, I think if you look at this, what he's doing, what, what came out today, as far as what he's doing with the Georgia Secretary of State, is not very different from what he was doing a month ago, you know, when he was trying to get the Michigan state legislators um, to That's go right. along with this kind of strategy. That's of right. The he had them to the White House. That's right. I forgot about that one. He really has tried to twist the arm in different states. Go ahead. Sorry. He's called. I mean, it supposedly he's had phone calls with you know GOP legislature legislators in you know, Pennsylvania and Arizona and Georgia and Wisconsin and elsewhere, trying to push this ridiculous you know notion that somehow uh, the election has been stolen. So I, I'm not that overly surprised by it. I think you know hearing it and seeing it firsthand is and hearing the audio of it is pretty extraordinary. Um, and I think really does sort of play the fact that the president has almost certainly committed a crime here. And you know I think that in itself is bad. But when you consider that, you know, 24 hours ago or or 36 hours ago, you had 12 Republican senators say they're going to object to the certification of the Electoral College results. And, you know, some estimates of more than 100, 140, maybe House Republicans objecting. What you're seeing here is just this full fledged effort by the GOP, by the way, which I don't think anyone thinks is going to succeed, including in the GOP. But this full fledged effort to sort of, you know, steal the election and to also sort of even more so, I think, to feed Trump's narcissism, his, vict- his victimization, his sense that he's being somehow you know, personally harmed by this. Isn't it, though, that they're just trying to raise money and get get keep his base support for their upcoming elections? I mean, if they turn against him. That, yes, that is definitely what's driving this. There's no question about it. They, they are. This is all about their. I mean, this is the cynicism of the GOP. I mean, the cynicism of it is just it's it's extraordinary because basically what they're doing is they're saying we are willing to undermine people's faith in, in, the, in the, the, the outcome of the election. We're willing to enable this just ridiculous, delusional, you know, tinfoil hat conspiracy theory that Trump is propagating, which, by the way, that's not even a theory, just putting, he's, if you listen to the audio today of this call, mm-hmm. he's just pulling out random things he's hit, you know, on social media and saying, did this happen? Did this happen? I've been, I've been cheated unfairly. But they're doing it, you know, I think with a full knowledge that this is not going to succeed, that it shouldn't succeed, that uh, just to basically pacify Trump and his base of supporters. That's all this is about. And the cynicism that would allow an elected member of Congress to do this is just it, it is very difficult to to comprehend, frankly. It's when, just difficult. Can you help me see it from the point of view of the Republican secretaries of state in Georgia and uh, some of these other states who's who's he has tried to cajole and to uh, blackmail or arm twist? Because 
their job, if I have it, I mean, their main job as secretary of state of a state is to run the election to make sure that the polling places are set up. And if they get it wrong, then they're in trouble. And if they do something fraudulently to affect the outcome one way or another, they get caught and go to jail. What, What is their point of view, the Republican secretary of state who Trump has been pressuring to change the vote somehow? Well, I give I give, you know, in Georgia, I'll give Brad Raffensperger, who's the secretary of state, there a lot of credit because he has really stood up to Trump on this. And I think, you know, he deserves some credit for doing that and for not being intimidated by him. But, you know, to the thing that I I wrote this a a little while ago in in my newsletter saying that, look, you know, this is terrifying, but it's not going to work because there's no one's going to go along with it. I mean, there really is just from every indication, you know, nobody is aside from the, the well, actually, no, really nobody. I mean, you know, no state legislators have gone along with this. No judges have gone along with this. The senators, congressmen are going along with it to the extent that it's not going to undermine the election. They're doing it because it's, you know, as you point out before, it's sort of politically in their interest. But but they're not actually doing anything actively trying to undermine the election, a- actively trying to, I should say, steal the election. Right. And so you have people like Raffensperger in, in, in Georgia and even Brian Kemp, who who. The idea that I'm praising Brian Kemp is just sort of mind boggling, but I am because really, you know, both of them have said we're have stood up to Trump on this. So I do think that what's happened here a little bit is is that Trump is fulminating. He's trying to get someone to go along and help him. No one's willing to do it, but they're willing to go through the sort of motions of doing it. You know what I mean? Like the, the, in, in Congress, in particular, they're willing to actually try to. Well, there are no consequences because there are no consequences. In fact, if anything, the consequences are positive for right. them. Right. But a secretary of state or a governor can't can't commit a crime. You, you, you're questioning your you're, you're praising Brian Kemp. I get it. He's a, he's a scoundrel. But these guys, whoever they are, they don't want to commit blatant crimes to affect the outcome of an election. It's a horrible crime. Actual right. voter uh, engineering of some sort. And reputationally, I mean, I think it would it would haunt them for the rest of their lives oh, if yeah. they to so much how to steal an election. And I think I didn't want to be seen as responsible for doing that. I mean, these are local officials. I mean, I don't know if Brad Asper has, has the greater ambitions, but. But he doesn't want to serve time for keeping Donald Trump in office. Well, I don't know that he would go to jail for it. <laughs> but even, you know, I think he, I don't think that would be the case. I think maybe I don't know. Actually, it's possible. I, what I think is more the case that he doesn't want to be, I think, associated with this kind of, you know, as, as my people would say, Michigas. That's what this basically <laughs> is. Um, and, I, you know, I think that. The other thing that, that I think is always striking about this is just that uh, what well, you said before, there's no consequences for this. I mean, not for Congress and not for pundits. No, every 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 Republican in, in Congress who does this and not the lawyers either going to benefit. They're going to benefit. Politically yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are going to benefit because tr- because it is a it is a cult it's and a cult. they have to appeal to the cult, even though they might not be in it. I mean, Republican legislators and and some of these, I think, highly influential right wing Trump supporting media people on on TV and, and YouTube and podcast. They're all benefiting. Right. And the thing is, it's it's not it's interesting because they they they're making kind of like I hate to say this and let me finish the sentence before it jumped down my throat. But they're making the smart political play. They're saying, look. You know, Trump is upset. Trump is going to you know, go after us if we don't go along with this. So the, the, the path of least resistance, if you're a Republican senator or a congressman, is just to play along with it, knowing that it will lead to nothing, knowing that they're not going to overturn the election. So, you know, in that sense, it's a smart political play. I mean, of course, from a moral standpoint, from an integrity standpoint, I mean, they're basically committing sedition. I mean, it's right. this is a serious crime. And it's and then morally, it's just indefensible what they're doing. They, I mean, they know Josh Hawley is an idiot. He knows there's no evidence of voter fraud. He, he is doing this solely because he wants the president in 2024. And he thinks this is the best way to appeal to Trump voters who are going to be voting uh, in the Republican primaries in four years. That's what this is all about. The most the most infuriating talking point or argument that you hear is from Republican senators and congressmen saying, listen, the American people have a lot of questions about what would happen, what happened. Trump supporters have a lot of questions about what happened. And of course, most journalists, anchors, hosts who are questioning them handle it pretty well, which is, well, yeah, they have a lot of questions because Trump is is making up things. And that's why they're questioning. He's the president 
of the United States. And so anything he questions, his supporters are going to question. They've done it by refusing to recognize that Biden won by by basically winking and nodding at these ridiculous election fraud arguments. They have created this uh, uh, belief among Trump voters. The election was stolen. I mean, this is really like honestly killing your parents and then being prosecuted and then begging for mercy because you're an orphan. That's really what this is. I mean, <laughs> they are the ones responsible yes. for the doubt that people have. Yeah, that's better than the arson. For being orphans. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's better than the uh, the arson analogy you usually hear. It's it's far more brutal, which is exactly what this this tactic is. And yes, yes. it's hard. The, it, it's hard to are the Menendez brothers. That's what they basically are. They're the Menendez brothers. <laughs> OK, it's hard to know where we go from here, because if because a lot of people are saying these 12 Republican senators, 140 House members need to be looked at and treated differently for the rest of time. But I don't know how you do that. I'm not sure even what that means. I, I don't know either. I mean, I think, you know, people like me, people like you. We should never let them figure what they've done, because what they've done is just truly contemptible, contemptuous. I mean, there's just there's nothing. The way to put it, what they've done is truly horrific right. and has more fundamentally undermined, undermined democratic legitimacy in this country than anything else I've seen in my lifetime by far. And that includes and I, I mean, I wasn't really cognizant of it, but that includes Watergate. This is worse. This is worse. And, I, I, you know, for Trump to get on the phone and to call Hogan secretary of state and basically say, I need 12000 votes. That's worse than what the Nixon tried to do. And the, the, the response of the uh, Republicans in Congress is to say, yeah. OK, fine. We're OK with this. We're going to enable this. So I don't know where you go from here. I mean, look, I think that, you know, the the the, the scary part of it is, is that they're not going to pay a price for it and it's going to benefit them. And if you're a red state Republican, you know, this is in your interest and this is probably going to going to help you. I mean, but I look at someone like I mean, like Steve Daines, who just won reelection in Montana. Yeah, you know, he, he's 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 not seen for six years. Got not much to worry about. He signed on to this letter. OK, this new senator from Wyoming, uh, Loomis is her last name. She signed on for it. She just she's there for six years. No Democrat is, you know, if the Messiah came back in Wyoming, he'd still lose to a Republican in Wyoming. And you know, as a Democrat, he'd still lose to a Republican. I mean, she's not going to lose that seat. Yeah, that's because Trump would trash the hell out of the Messiah on Twitter. Who is this right. guy? OK, a lot of questions. I don't think he can do any of the things that he says he can. Loser. <laughs> he's a sucker uh, and a loser. So, That's so I just, yeah, and like he's a, he's a loser and a sucker because obviously he died for, you know, everyone else's sins, right? So he's a loser and a sucker. Who does that? <laughs> Who does that? Yeah, loser. really good points. Well, I have to ask you what I asked uh, two other uh, people that I wanted to talk to you about this today, uh, which is in light of what is happening to this country, this horrific. Uh, humanitarian disease, it's a disaster. By oh, the way, three thousand yeah. Americans dying each and every day. Last week, a good buddy of mine lost both his mom and dad within three days. It, it, everybody has a story like that. Everybody knows somebody who's lost somebody. It's horrible, and yet the president and these uh, supporters of his in in the House and Senate are trying to overthrow an election where there is zero fraud, like none. And do, by the way, doing absolutely nothing to deal with the pandemic. I mean, I think we've lost like 20,000 Americans since Christmas or something. I mean, <sighs> not even a story anymore. It's barely even a story. And and then you have the vaccine issue, which is just a, a, appears to be a complete, you know, Well, disaster. that's that's people like to make those either or arguments. And I'm not sure that they're always fair, but I mean, if you did have like a, a bunch of things happening at once, that would be one thing like Obama with the BP oil well and, and trying to pass health care. Like a lot of things were happening at that point, but this is, you're going after a thing that didn't the deep cut right there. Like I've been, the I'm reading his book. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, but this is, you're going after to overturn an election that, that there's no problem. And meanwhile, People are dying all over the place. Yeah. And they yeah. could be being we have the vaccine and you're fucking up the rollout. No, I mean it what can you say? I mean it's 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 uh yeah, I wrote this book, you know, about a year and a half ago basically arguing that like the US is is, you know, like a banana republic. We're barely a functional country. And and I think that 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 uh 
notion has been has been bolstered by what's happened the past you know nine or ten months. Because it's two things. First of all, it's that we we lack the infrastructure to do effective vaccine distribution. This isn't just a problem of Trump. It is a problem of Trump, but it's it's a bigger problem. We lack the infrastructure to distribute this vaccine effectively to everybody who needs it. That's one problem. The second problem is we are so uh, divided and polarized politically that nothing gets done in Washington, right? So you can, you put those two things together, a country that doesn't function properly, a country that has basically decided the last 20 or 30 years that government really should be shortchanged, doesn't really matter, we don't, we don't spend money on it, along with a government that just doesn't seem at all interested in solving the problems that we have in this country. And that's a that's a perfect storm of, of shit, <laughs> if I may speak very clearly about it. Yeah. It really is. And that's where we are as a country right now. We, we, we lack the infrastructure, we lack the capabilities, we lack the, the basic you know, know-how to f- deal with these issues. And then we're so politically polarized that we can't tackle them in Washington either. We can't fix the problem. And you know, this isn't gonna get better in January 20th. I mean, thankfully Trump will be gone, but even if Democrats win in Georgia, which I, I sort of think is a possibility, you're not going to the problems we're dealing with are not going to disappear, not going to disappear overnight. They're going to they're going to stay mm-hmm. here because Republicans are going to continue to obstruct everything that Democrats and Joe Biden want to do. Because just- they they do not have any uh, respect for the idea of the, the, the role of of government, period, not strong government, not weak government. They just they want to destroy it. They're so uninterested in governing and they're so bad at it when they try and their interests are all aligned with the, such a small group of people that, of course, it's going to be fucked up. The rollout. But they also benefit politically from it. They benefit politically right. from basically mm-hmm. obstructing Joe Biden. I mean, there's no question about it. This is a good thing for them as far, politically. It helps them. Uh, a government doesn't work properly. So they can say, "Oh, look, government's terrible to do anything." Mm-hmm. B, if if they slow down the, the you know the the response to the COVID or they slow down the economy, that's going to hurt Biden. It certainly worked against Trump and against Obama in 2010. So this is all part of a political strategy to basically do damage to the country and benefit politically from it. And that's where I, I remember this piece like 10 years ago, basically arguing that you know that Republicans have as a as a political agenda are trying to undermine America, trying to hurt America. And this was related to the recovery from the, the, the crash, that they were on purpose trying to prevent stimulus from going on to the economy, which would help the economy, yes. which, would, which would then, they, they saw yes. benefiting Obama. If the if economy did, did poorly, benefit them. I remember I wrote that piece, I got a lot of pushback. I, I remember Republicans, some people on the Hill, I got emails from them saying, how dare you say this about us? We, we care about people. No, you don't, you don't. You see the political benefit mm. in things being bad. And that's kind of where we are as a country. And, and frankly, that won't change. Now, look, there's a possibility that, you know, there's a, there's, there's a Romney or Murkowski or Collins will act like reasonable Republicans. You know, I'm not counting on that happening. Um, I think there's a possibility Democrats take control of the Senate. I think it's, you know, maybe 51 percent possibility mm-hmm. that happens on, on Tuesday in the Georgia Senate runoff. But even then, you're still going to have, you know, knuckleheads like Joe Manchin will be like, oh, I can't get rid of the filibuster because that's good. That, that, that's just right. you know, too divisive, right. which means basically hands all the political power to Mitch McConnell to just do whatever he can to fuck with Joe Biden. You know, smart, Joe. Very smart. Uh, Nancy Pelosi nearly won the her vote for reelection as speaker uh, at the House. What is your reaction to her? No surprise there. I mean, she's going to have a very tough time with that caucus. It's very narrow. I think she's a seven or eight seat majority. Um you know, I, it's it's going to be very hard and she's going to have to deal with, you know, she thinks she had had problems with the squad and the, and the progressives the fir- last two years. It's going to get a lot worse in the next two years because she only has like seven, I think, seven or eight votes. That's all, all her margin for error is. So anything they pass is going to have to get approval of, you know, those uh, purple state or purple district Democrats as well as the liberals. And I think knowing Pelosi, she's going to be more focused on those purple state Democrats or those those those. Democrats in swing districts, and she will about you know AOC and 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 you know Ilhan Omar and so forth. Yeah, it's uh, going to be very interesting, but it, it's a, it's a I think a job that most people have no idea uh, what it entails and what the responsibilities of the Speaker of the House are. But basically, if I were to minimize it into uh, a sentence, it's get a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of different backgrounds, ideas, and interests on the same page. Well, you know, but I'll say this. I think one thing about Pelosi, and I've been critical of her about this in the past. I think one thing that you that you can criticize her for is that she's very parochial. And I mean that in the sense that she 
her focus the first two years was preserving the House majority. Mm. And I think she did a lot of things that undermined Democrats nationally because she thought it helped a few Democrats in swing districts. And so, you know, I, I mean, I think the best example is actually is, is impeachment pre impeachment when she basically, you know, you, you, people forget this. A majority of Democrats before the Ukraine phone call became public, a majority of Democrats supported uh, impeachment of Trump. Yep. Majority. Yep. Um, but she fought it because she thought it would, it would hurt these Democrats who were in swing districts. Um, you know, of course, she she eventually went along because she had no choice after the Ukraine stuff came out. But, I, you know, what that said to me was that she was willing to, you know, I think do things, I, I think undermine Democrats or at least not think. I think she was thinking more about Democrats, congressional House Democrats in close districts and about the party as a whole. And she may do the same thing you know, with Biden. I mean, I think she wants Biden to succeed, but I think she's also very focused on keeping the majority. And ultimately, that's kind of her job is to keep the majority in the House. Uh, she is the Speaker of the House. She's the head of the Democratic Caucus. Her job is to keep Democrats in charge in, in the House. Of and imagine if they didn't have the majority right now with what we're seeing. God help us, right? Um, but, you know, look, uh, thankfully, at least, we don't have Trump in office and there's a Democrat in the White House, so I think that's going to contribute to something, things being a little bit better uh, in the country. And again, I, like I said, I think that um, this Georgia Senate race is, is going to be interesting. Uh, Dem- uh, Republicans are going to need a huge, huge turnout on Election Day, uh, which is Tuesday, and bigger than they got, I think, um, proportionally. Uh, Do you think got- that the you know Trump is supposed to be going down there? I think. Do you think that this phone call, which is with the Georgia Secretary of State, who's Republican, do you think? that his his crazy lawyers and some of the things that they've said, do you think there's any way that it will depress the turnout in Georgia on this Senate runoff, which is they're hard? No, it can. I mean, I guess the thing for me is that I, I look, this was a very close election uh, in Georgia, right? Biden won by about 12,000 votes. Um, you know, uh, uh, Purdue uh, beat us off, although they didn't get 50 percent. Obviously, that's, that's how we have a runoff. Beat him by, you know, a uh, I don't know. Not that it wasn't that many votes. And and really, this election is about about turnout, mobilizing your supporters. And it, and every indication is Democrats have mobilized their supporters in early voting and, and in really big numbers. Yeah. I mean, I think everything you read says that Democrats have done a good job of getting Democrats out voting early. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to win because Republicans can come out Election Day and, and swamp that early vote turnout. But when you combine the fact that you've got Democrats turning out in huge numbers with the fact that Republicans are being told by the president that the governor is a Republican and Secretary of State is a governor is a Republican, are corrupt and should resign. And he's saying this. And he said the other day on Twitter uh, that this election, the Senate election should be invalid, <laughs> which was all right, whatever. But that's what he right. That's what he's been saying. So, you know. Everything I've read is that the early vote is 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 down more in redder districts than in blue districts, which you know could be an indication that some Republicans are saying we don't want to vote. I don't think it's a huge thing, but when you got a close race as this one was, it doesn't take a lot to shake the outcome. If you if, if you're talking about a couple percentage points of people who stay home, yeah, that matters in a close election, and this is going to be a close election. So, yes, it could matter. I, I, I have no – everyone I talk to, no one gives me a clear sense of what's going to happen. Yeah. But I, I think that, yes, it can make a difference. And that we will not know probably until Election Day the extent to which Trump's actions have depressed turn out there. Oh, boy, I hope that they have. Michael Cohen, I appreciate you joining me tonight to talk about these really important, relevant uh, circumstances, giving us your perspective as always. is very valuable. Thank you, sir. My pleasure as always. And that is Michael Cohen of the Boston Globe, columnist there, as well as lawyer and comedian J.L. Covan and constitutional law professor Eric Siegel of Georgia State, of course. And that's what I have for you today. I had a separate plan, some different ideas, some things in the tank that I was going to share. But then on Sunday afternoon, a word of the president's phone call and it le- leaking uh, change my mind, and I wanted to get some different takes, and I'm so glad that I did, and that's the value of the podcast and of my network, which is the value of the program. It's here every day. You can count on me getting the best experts on the most important issues and having great conversations here for you, as well as news and other things that you can relate to and that we can help 
grow each other and this brilliant community together. And that's all I've got for you today. Join me on Thursday night, 8 p.m. Sign up to be a supporter and a member of the stand-up community where we commiserate and share and grow and make each other laugh each and every day on the Discord platform, which is always available to all subscribers as well, 24-7, so that you're not ever alone. And it's not me just saying those words. Hope to see you there, and I will talk to you here tomorrow. Subscribe now, write a review, tell your friends. Bye-bye.